Hej och välkomna till Udda Ting, en podcast om sällsamma historier, kreativitet och kreatörerna själva. Mitt namn är Henrik Möller och musiken är skapad av Testbild och loggan till podden är gjord av Malmö-konstnären Nalle Chinsky. Det här avsnittet ska handla om författaren Ursula K. Le Guin. Ursula K. Le Guin var en legend i fantasy- och science fiction-kretsar. Kanske mest känd för sina övervärden böcker Earthsea som kom ut under 60, 70, 90 och nya historier som kom långt in på 1000, 2000-talet. Men också hennes Heinsvit, kanske då den mest kända Left Hand of Darkness, mörkrets vänstra hand, som redan 1969 behandlade könstillhörighet och könlöshet. Inom fantasy science fiction med kanske undantaget av Margaret Atwood som är tio år yngre så får jag nog påstå att Ursula K. Le Guin var först med ett feministiskt perspektiv inom fantasy science fiction. Hon föddes 1929 och dog 22 januari i år. Och innan vi går vidare i detta så måste jag bara tipsa om att nu på torsdag den 8 november klockan 19.30 på Bio Rio i Stockholm så går långfilmsdokumentären om Ursula gjord av filmaren Arwen Curry. Den heter Worlds of Ursula K. Le Guin. Den är riktigt, riktigt bra så jag rekommenderar alla som har möjlighet att gå att se den. Och det är filmaren Arwen Curry som är dagens gäst och ska prata med mig om Ursula K. Le Guin och hennes dokumentärfilm. Hon har följt Ursula i tio år med sin dokumentärfilm så jag kan inte tänka mig en bättre gäst. So, can you remember one of the first novels you read by Ursula that made an impression? I think the first one I remember was The Lathe of Heaven, which is her novel. Um, I think it was set in the, it was set in the future, I think something like 2006. Uh, so it's the past now. And it's a novel about a man whose dreams change reality. And so he has these vivid dreams and he wakes up and everything is different but he's the only one who knows it and this was very compelling to me when i was a kid uh, to think about this constantly shifting reality that that only you could be aware of and uh, you know the idea that the world could be kind of moving under your feet all the time fascinated by the um idea that reality maybe wasn't reality at all um so there's a scene in that novel where The man, he's being controlled by this kind of ambitious, do-gooder psychologist who's trying to use his dreams to make the world a better place and in the process keeps creating all these complications and, um, you know, eventually causing more damage than, than, you know, there was before. So he has George, the protagonist, dream that he creates this machine that controls the dreams and he tells George to dream that there's a i think it's a pink dog in the room. And and when George wakes up, there's a pink dog in the room. But he's the only one who knows that that yesterday, before his dream, there were no pink dogs. For everyone else in the world, there've always been, you know, yellow and white and brown and black and pink dogs. And so he's the only one who knows that that, that just happened as a, a result of his dream. And this idea that, you know, uh that that it, your dreams could inflect to the world around you um was very fascinating to me. Ursula explored so many interesting ideas in her work. Could you talk about some of them? Ursula's work, she wrote fantasy novels of course, but she also some of her most famous novels are uh set in the system called the Ecumen, which is this consortium of worlds that uh are connected in this loose kind of system called the Ecumen. And people can go from one to the other, and each contains a, a very different type of society with often different human beings. They might look different. They might um, have a very different society, but they're all humans in some way. They're all people. And she uses these worlds to conduct um, what one of the interviewees in the film calls thought experiments, where she looks at different conditions that might shape how people interact and behave. And she used her novels really as these anthropological or ethnographic experiments, but that are done in this very beautiful language with these very clear, simple stories and, and characters that, that often encounter each other or meet each other across these you know, gulfs of, of different cultures. So she was really talking about human connection and about how we can live differently, what human society could look like, uh, how we can encounter each other from very different cultures. 
in the context of these very far flung planets that she invented. Uh, so the ideas are very rich, but I think they would not have survived on their own if it wasn't for her um, very clean, clear prose and her beautiful use of language. When you talk about Ursula, I almost immediately think of Margaret Atwood. I know they were contemporaries, but were they friends? Or more importantly, did they ever collaborate on anything? Margaret Atwood and Ursula Le Guin um, knew each other and were friends. Uh, our, Margaret Atwood is, I think, a decade younger than Ursula was, which she was quick to point out to me when I interviewed her in the in the film. So they weren't exactly contemporaries, but they were, um, you know, they were also, you could say, within half a generation of each other. Well, Margaret Atwood was 10 years younger than Ursula when she got published, so that would technically make her a contemporary colleague. There you go. Yes, yes. No, that's right. That's right. I don't know how they were... Um, crossing paths uh, sort of in the 70s and 80s i don't get the sense that they were really following each other's work at that point i think it their friendship happened later um you know maybe maybe the 80s and 90s but i'm not positive about that um they did have some friction but it was friendly but they did have some friction about what ursula perceived as margaret atwood distancing herself from science fiction um kind of allowing the stigma of science fiction to push her away from that label. Whereas Ursula was saying, no, I do write science fiction. It's just that science fiction can be good, right? So she was staying within that world and trying to kind of elevate it. And she felt at times that Margaret Atwood was pushing it away and trying to kind of save herself and put herself in the realm of real literature. So they had, you know, they had a little bit of a back and forth in terms of uh, writing about this with in essays and um and they did you know they had a really friendly rapport with each other so it was a friendly argument but there was that argument when did this idea to make a documentary about ursula take shape i was working as the editor of a venerable punk magazine in san francisco called maximum rock and roll that's been around since the early 80s and i had been there for several years uh editing the magazine and I was ready to kind of move on and start doing some different types of journalism. And I decided I wanted to go back to journalism school. I, to, I wanted to go to journalism school, graduate school. And I, I got into a program at Berkeley and I was thinking about what I might do there. And around the same time, I was having some conversations with my best friend that had to do with some of the feminist writers that we cared deeply about uh, and who had influenced us as writers and as people. I think we had just gotten back from listening to Adrian, Adrian Rich, the poet, um, read. And we were talking about those writers that had meant so much to us and sort of how they got to be where they were. And I started thinking about Ursula and making the connection between that writer that I cared about as a child and this contemporary writer that was, you know, very prolific um, throughout her life and was still writing as we were having this conversation. And I sort of thought this could be a really rich story. And the more I kind of investigated it and started to do some research and learned more about her life, the more I felt strongly that that this would be, um, you know, a worthwhile film to make. And so I was thinking about that before I went to graduate school and I ended up doing the film program, kind of following a documentary program in order to learn how to make documentary films so that I could eventually approach her and ask her if I could make this film about her life. So they kind of happened in tandem. And then I did eventually contact her in, I think, 2007 or 2008. And we did our first shoot in 2008. But so there was a there was a process of convincing her to, you know, to let me work on it as well. When you started out, what were the things that you were curious about exploring in the documentary? Yes, absolutely. There were things I wanted to investigate. I mean, I knew sort of the, you know, the the facts, the basic facts of her life, you know, where she went to college and that her father was a famous anthropologist and all these sorts of things. But I didn't know um, many of the nuances. And I certainly didn't know what the experience was like from her perspective, which is what I was probably most, you know, most interested in. Um, I also wanted to know something about how a person uh, successfully has a creative life like she had, how they managed to create this work and still sort of live in the world and balance all the things that they want to do. So there were some, you know, kind of some 
questions I had about her process um, that really needed to hear from from her. And um, and I did learn a great deal at, the whole time. I never stopped learning from her, you know, throughout the entire decade that we were filming, which is not one continual decade of filming. But, you know, here and there when I got the funding and I got some money um, over the course of about 10 years. Can you talk about some of the new things that you learned while making the documentary that you didn't know previously? Well, most of the time I wasn't learning necessarily new facts, but I was learning more about the the kind of bullet points of her biography that that I already knew. I was learning more about the reality of it and more about the experience of it. Um what it was like to grow up uh, as the daughter of a of a famous anthropologist and a writer um who was writing about some of those anthropo anthropological subjects. What it was like to, you know, be a a young woman in kind of the heyday of the new wave science fiction in the late 60s and 70s. Um, and I, I guess the new things that I learned, some of what happened in the, in the course of making the film, um, I kind of got to see firsthand sort of how she was sometimes marginalized still in the beginning of that, uh, of production and how toward the end of it, she really became much more accepted into the canon, you know, as sort of culminated by her getting the National Book Award in, in 2014 and how, you know, she was really, she really came full circle to being accepted as one of the United States' greatest writers, but that it took toward the end of, you know, her entire life to get there. Could you talk about some of the story arcs that you explore in the documentary? One of the arcs of story that we looked at was this changing acceptance of science fiction and fantasy and what her role in, in that was. Um, so yeah, when she was first publishing in the sixties and seventies, uh, science fiction and fantasy were considered marginal. They were considered, um, something for, you know, uh, geeky, young science minded kids and not much else. And, um, she kind of refused to accept that real good literature couldn't happen in this realm. And so she kind of put everything into it and created works that nobody could deny had, you know, all of the hallmarks of true literature. So she was, she was instrumental in, in elevating science fiction and fantasy um, to a place where people had to admit that the real work was taking place there. And I think that happened, you know, she was, she was progressively less marginalized. I mean, I think it, it went in, in a, not in one steady climb, but in kind of dips and rises and dips and rises. Because I think she was, you know, when she first came onto the scene, she was very um, popular in the science fiction world. And then when she began writing more from the point of view of women and she began really exploring what it meant to be a feminist in science fiction, she had a kind of a backlash from some of her male readers who had first accepted her and wanted her to write um, these kind of as one of, somebody says in the film, these action adventures in space. Instead, she started doing all this other stuff and people said, hey, you know, I don't want to read this. This isn't what, what I signed up for. Some of her readers. Okay. Yes, that is interesting. A thing that a lot of younger people today take for granted, the feminism in fantasy and science fiction. But it was a very different, hard time back then in the days where Ursula started out. Could you talk about that journey she made? One of the main things we talk about in the in worlds of Ursula K. Le Guin, kind of the arc of the story is based around Ursula's um, coming into her own feminism, because people, you know, particularly people of that generation, didn't start out as feminists. They they had to get there somehow, and uh, that process was often really difficult. And she did it through her work. She did it in a way that you can see. So our film starts with A Wizard of Earthsea, which is one of her most famous works, a work of fantasy. In the early works of fantasy, her characters are, her, her main characters are powerful male wizards. Um, and the women are kind of, they're village witches who um, don't have much power and are kind of crouching in the shadows. And by then she comes around by 1990 when she came back to Earthsea to write a second set of novels. She doesn't reject the first 
books of Earthsea. But instead, she kind of turns her eye to a different part of the of the world. And she sees it from the perspective of the people who were marginalized, the people who were oppressed. And I think that that's a good way to look at how she evolved as a person. She had to kind of re- uh, evaluate her own opinions and realize that she had been writing from the perspective of a man because that's what she was taught because that's what science fiction was because that's what literature was and she grew up reading literature and she absorbed that point of view as most women writers do and you know did and still do sometimes so she had to kind of really take that apart and i think she did that in the in mostly in the 1980s and in the 1990s and say what is it? What does my writing look like if it's really coming from me as a woman? Um, and that changed her writing a lot. And some of her earlier readers rejected her and said, "This isn't what you know. This isn't what we want from Ursula Le Guin. We want you know this this powerful male wizard. We want this powerful spaceman." And she went through it anyway. And as she told me in an interview that's in the film, if she hadn't gone through that process, that radical revision of her own work she probably would have stopped writing. So that, that process of evolution, although it was difficult and, and not always understood by herself or the people around her, was what allowed her to, to come to her full maturity as a writer. And that's what allowed us to have this whole body of work that went on until, you know, until she died. One thing this pod has as a goal is to explore creation and creativity. Did you talk to Ursula about her creative process? We talked about that quite a bit, uh, different parts of it. One thing I remember really clearly is she talked about something, she talked about the creative process, uh, particularly writing novels, as a kind of compost. So she would bring in all these ideas, she would absorb all this information from the world around her, from other novels, from um, you know, her own work from various sources. And she would kind of put it into this composting machine and it would just kind of break down and become this other substance. And then eventually, you know, it would, something would grow. And she didn't quite know where it had grown from. She sort of let that happen and let it play out and trusted the process a lot. I think she trusted her own creative force, um, you know, very deeply. And uh, that was, you know, she talked about that. She talked about how important place was. And we kind of structured the film around that also in a little, a little bit. And that we, we went with her to the places that inspired some of her most famous and um, convincing imaginative worlds, like the, the Southern Oregon desert and the, the coast, um, the Oregon coast and the Napa Valley in California. Some of the places that, that, she first sat in and germinated the images of, of her. Let me scratch that. Some of, some of the places that inspired the city of Havnor in Earthsea, that inspired um, the tombs in the tombs of Achuan. So uh, she talked about place as the thing that came to her first. She said, place comes to me first, and then the people grow up in the place. So she would first imagine a landscape and her relationship with places was really deep. Um, she felt very connected uh, to certain places and would go back there over and over again in her life. Um, and so we try to go to those places in the film. And then the people came from this environment that they lived in and she would imagine them as inhabiting the place and their culture would spring up from those first, you know, those first images of the place. But who inspired Ursula? Did you talk to her about her predecessors, maybe people like Tolkien? I talked with Ursula a great deal about Tolkien. She um, she loved Tolkien and she loved Middle Earth. And she read those novels to her three children that she was raising as she was writing her, her books. Um, and she read them, I think, several times to her kids. And she talked about how Tolkien uh, helped create an environment in the late 60s where fantasy could kind of start emerging from, you know, something that only belonged to children and start being something bigger than that, something more, um, not that there's anything wrong with work for children, but that something that had more possibilities and that people started to take seriously. Um, so she talked about Tolkien as kind of proving that 
people cared uh, about fantasy when it was done right. And also that, you know, that he set this pace for um, creating a world with really strong rules that you had to follow, you know, a, a very coherent fantasy world. And she was influenced by many other writers. She was uh, influenced and by science fiction writers of the same period who were, um, and, and just before her, who were kind of interested in those ideas of uh, anthropology and ethnography and, and culture and even, you know, the human mind, that people were moving away from just talking about the technology and started talking about relationships and what was going on in psychology and what was going on in sexuality and kind of looking at the different possibilities for what science fiction could do. So she was reading a great deal of what her contemporaries were doing. And I think she read, uh, you know, she admired uh, Cordwainer Smith and Theodore Sturgeon, uh, certainly Philip K. Dick. She read, um, Vonda McIntyre, she read, I think, everyone who was writing at the same time, and she had strong opinions about all of it. And she, you know, immediately started correspondence with many writers. Um, and I did a, a lot of reading of that correspondence when I was working on the film. That's really interesting. Could you share something that was in those letters? I'll, I'll share two things. One is um, I, I spent a long time reading Ursula's letters back and forth between her and, and other writers. And she wrote prolifically. She obviously had loved these conversations that were taking place over the mail. They, they obviously were exciting and vital and full of excla exclamation points and, you know, terms of endearment. And it was really lovely to, to read all of that and see how, um, how vital and exciting everything was at the time in science fiction. So there was one set of letters between her and Philip K. Dick. <clears throat> I should say, they weren't a set. They were really just his letters to her. Usually she saved copies of her own letters so you could read the entire correspondence. But for some reason, there was only copies of his side of the correspondence. And they were so funny because um, I don't think that they were close friends. They were admirers of each other's work. And he would start the letter by saying, you know, I really loved your latest story and whatever magazine, you know, fantasy and science fiction magazine. You know, it's, I'm so excited about that. It's really great. So anyway, last weekend, this chick came to stay with me and we just went on this trip and it was crazy. And then there would be like six pages of just him talking about his various adventures and relationships and just just like a stream of consciousness that had nothing to do with her or you know anything that they shared in common. But it was so well written and engaging that it was just like mesmerizing to read. Uh, so that was one thing that was one like little gem in her correspondence. And then another kind of more important um, set of letters was between Ursula and James Tiptree Jr. Do you know James Tiptree Jr.? No. So James Tiptree Jr. was a somewhat older, maybe a decade older than Ursula, a writer who um, started showing up in the magazines in the 70s. Uh, in science fiction. And there was a real buzz around this writer because he wasn't showing up at any of the conferences. Nobody really knew who he was. And this was kind of a small world. It was like a small community. Everybody knew each other. And here was this guy writing these really kind of electrifying um, short stories with titles like uh, The Women Men Don't See and, you know, really kind of explosive stuff about men and women and, and power and, um, People were excited. He started winning awards. And then nobody knew who he was. So Ursula had started a correspondence with him. And they wrote these letters back and forth that became, you know, very friendly and um, kind of affectionate. And they would kind of talk about everything going on in the science fiction world. They would talk about their work. Um, they would support each other. And then it, what happened was someone in the science fiction community found, like basically did some detective work and found out who James Tiptree Jr. was. There had been some speculation that it might be a woman. And then other writers had shot that down saying, a woman couldn't write these stories. These stories are obviously written by a man. So it turned out that in fact, James Tiptree Jr. was a woman named Alice Sheldon. And she was a very interesting woman. She had been a CIA agent, she had grown up on safari with her parents in Africa who were big game hunters. 
she had this very fascinating um, biography and she had these stories to write and she wrote them as a man. And she really was kind of, in some sense, a man and a woman at the same time. And so she had to kind of come when she realized that her identity was going to be uh, released to the world. She wrote Ursula a letter that said, basically, I have to tell you something. I'm actually not Tip, as you know me. I'm not James Tiptree Jr. I'm a woman. I'm a middle-aged woman, you know, living in a suburban home with a husband. And um, it was like this, you know, Ursula had no idea, no idea. She had been almost flirtatious in her letters, you know, and, and I think it was like a marvelous revelation. She said, oh, you marvelous thing, you. You know, it was just like such a surprise that, and such a delight. And that was really, um, it was it was really interesting to read that correspondence. Could you talk a little bit about Ursula's legacy? She inspired so many people, and among those people, many writers. I think you can safely say that Ursula Le Guin inspired several generations uh, in her lifetime of writers, and I'm sure she will continue to inspire many more. Um, so she had the writers she was working alongside in the 60s and 70s, but then there were generations that came after that, and they benefited from her having kind of raised up the bar uh, for work in science fiction and also broadened, broadening its scope so that many, many more different kinds of ideas could be explored um, or, or just kind of doing it first so that you could see what could be done. She really took it, you know, to, to, um, to its limits. And, you know, there are writers in the film that represent that generation like Neil Gaiman and uh, Michael Chabon and David Mitchell. Uh, Margaret Atwood is a little bit older, but you know she again, I think, was inspired by Ursula. Um, you know, I'm not sure about that. I wouldn't want to say that actually about Margaret Atwood because she might not agree with that that she was really inspired in the same way. But I, I will say that an entire generation of writers who are now, I would say, in their 50s, um, really inherited something from Ursula of tremendous value which was uh, the ability to use fantastic elements in their work without the risk of this kind of stigmatization and marginalization, um, or much less of a risk than Ursula's generation faced. So because Ursula and some others did it before them and kind of showed that excellent, excellent work was being done in these fields and uh, that so many different kinds of ideas could be explored there, these other writers said, you know, I can do whatever I want. I can use these tools and I'm going to. And those include, those writers include Michael Chabon and uh, Neil Gaiman and David Mitchell. And uh, th there are many, many other writers, Zadie Smith, I would put in that category, who kind of use these fantastic elements and are unafraid um, to be put in a marginal category. So that's a beautiful gift to leave behind. And then I think that the ideas themselves, the kind of project she had of imagining a radically different world, that project has been inherited by an even younger generation of writers um, within the science fiction world who are saying, we want to have a radical vision. We want to have a feminist vision. We want to have a vision where uh, gender is fluid. We want to have um, a vision where there are different kinds of power in, you know, that, that operate in the world. And they, I think, take her utopian visions and her complicated utopian visions to entirely new places. So I think her legacy actually refracts in different generations in different ways, and it will continue to do so because it's so, um, it's so generous and so complex. Och med de orden var det slut för den här gången. Mitt namn är Henrik Möller. Musiken är skapad av Testbild. Hej då!